I'm a SENCO and essentially that means I am the Special Educational Needs Coordinator for my school. Um, ideally a SENCO would be part of the leadership team of the school. This ensures that um, special needs is high on the priority list for the school and it shapes the ethos of the school. There's lots of liaising with external agencies, lots of frustration, but ultimately it's the best job in the world because you're advocating for the most vulnerable people within our society. I think the parents are always the first to notice when there's something maybe not quite right with their child, something that you think, um, you know, unusual behaviours, there's obvious signs to look for if there's a language delay or a physical delay, but there's also quite sort of um, small signs that parents look out for. And what I hear a lot from parents is that when they're at children's parties or um, if they're at a play group, they notice things um, with their children that perhaps sort of stand out to them. Um, and it could be anything, it could be anything. Um, the two year check is vital for young children, I would say. Um, that's when a health visitor can pick up on anything that they see or anything that the parents might have seen. And then the health visitor is a key person in sort of directing the parents to some additional support or some places that they can go to potentially have an assessment for their child. Um, during the pandemic, lots of two year checks didn't take place unfortunately. Um, well, certainly not face to face anyway. Um, lots of these two-year checks were virtual and I think a lot of things were missed. Um, once your child starts at nursery, it could be that the teacher, the, the nursery teacher, notices things about the child. Um, again, lots of little things, maybe that they're walking on tiptoes or um, they're playing alongside children rather than with other children. Um, perhaps they don't want to come and sit with the other children on the carpet. Um, they're struggling physically outside. Um, they're not picking up on basic phonics, rhyming, songs, lots and lots of different signs. I would say go with your gut and I would say forge a really good relationship with your nursery teacher, your reception teacher, well, or your general, you know, your child's teacher. Um, form that great relationship and it's easier to talk to them. I would go to them as soon as you're worried. Um, the teacher can look out for things. Um, they can give you the heads up. Are they doing this at school? Are they not noticing this school? Doing this at school? Are they doing other things at school? Um, I would go pretty much straight away and just speak to them, just speak to them and have an honest conversation with them. A school can do quite a lot of things, so what we would say is that we would look for any provision that's ordinarily available within a school. So that could mean some changes in, changes in teaching styles, um, the classroom setup, um, small intervention groups, and every borough has got an ordinarily available document on their website um, that you should you should read. Um, have a look at it. It will give you ideas about things that your school should be able to provide. So, for example, we run an intervention called Talk Boost. So, Talk Boost for our younger children helps them with their language acquisition and um, their social communication. Um, we've got another group called um, Attention Autism. So these are for people that have been diagnosed with autism and it's a highly motivating group that um, is working on their attention and listening. Um, you know, we, there's loads of interventions that you can provide as a school within your ordinarily available provision. If a child requires more than this, provision that is more than what is ordinarily available at your school, then you'd apply for an education healthcare plan. The application for this, um, it varies borough to borough. Um, it's a big, lengthy document um, that takes a while to complete. But ideally, the plan comes with funding. And this funding is usually used for additional support at school hopefully through the form of a learning support assistant. Um, some boroughs, it doesn't come with funding straight away. That's an, an additional application. 
Um, but here in Barnet, it's, um, it comes with funding. The funding is banded. So they look at the needs of the child and they, they sort of give you a band in for what you think, what they think um, would cover the provision cost for that child. Um, the document then is a legal document. We call it the golden ticket. This is your legal document that will track your child until they, and be given to your child until they're 25. Um, it has measurable outcomes on there that your, your school, you know, must help the child meet these outcomes and it's reviewed annually. The ideal scenario would be if a parent noticed something about their child before you um, and they came to you, but on occasions it's the teacher that has to speak to the parents. And I think this is a key conversation and something that's so important because guaranteed these parents will remember this forever, this first conversation with a, a teacher that there's something maybe quite different or there's something that the teacher is concerned about. So you have to go about it with lots of love and lots of nurtured nurture and empathy um, so you ideally the teacher would speak to the parent first of all because I think if you call in the senko at, at the first stop it's really sort of intimidating for the parents and it, when you see another adult that you're not used to seeing um, attending a meeting I think it can it can be quite scary for them um, so initially the the teacher would have the conversation with the parents and perhaps you would come up with a few strategies together on things that you can try and work on initially at school and then I would say not soon after you know not long after um, you would call in the senko and then maybe some formal referrals would be made at that point maybe to speech and language therapist to um, the paediatrician we've got lots of external agencies that we can refer to depending on the need Quite often, children are very different at home to how they are at school. And I think a really good um, sort of tip would be to take videos of your children, make notes of the things that you're worried about and show them to the teacher and say, look, have you seen this? Have you seen this behaviour at school? Is this something that you see? Because quite often they are different um, at school and at home. But the key thing is that you work together um, it doesn't matter that they're different at school to at, at home. You know, you both have a common sort of goal and you work together. Initially, when you see that your child is different and perhaps they would get a diagnosis of some sort, um, often parents go through a grieving process because the child is not quite who they thought they would be and you're worried about their future because when you have a child you have their future planned out in your head and um, you know it might not be the future you saw for them and I think it's so important for schools to be sort of empathetic about that, sympathetic about that and, and to understand how the parents are feeling and it can put a big pressure on families as well when you do have a child that may get a diagnosis or, or has di or um, difficulties it puts a big pressure on the family on your relationships um, but you'll get through it <laughs> you'll get through it with the right support but it is a process and we all need to be aware of that and be sympathetic to it I can remember the first time that my son's nursery had some concerns about him and I remember going into the room and again there was somebody there that I wasn't expecting to be there and they didn't actually want to say to me that they were worried he had autism. I think they wanted me to say it first and um, yes I had sort of sort of um, feelings that maybe he did have some autistic tendencies. Um, we have autism in the family, so it wouldn't have been that much of a shock if he was. But I think hearing it from them was a big shock to me still. And I remember the day well, and I took him to Pizza Express. <laughs> and then I went to meet a friend of mine at Barnet Library, and I sobbed because I thought, what now? What's going to happen now? And um, Sometimes the, your family can be supportive and our family is supportive, but sometimes you will get maybe members saying, don't be silly, he's lovely, what's wrong with him? There's nothing wrong with him. And you're saying, well, no, we're not saying there's anything wrong with him. We're just saying that, you know, perhaps he's autistic and we need to find the right support for him. And it puts a huge pressure, 
huge pressure on the family. And I know some parents here don't tell always members of their family. They keep a diagnosis quiet because they are still worried about the effect or, you know, a stigma attached to a diagnosis. I see parents who don't want to chase a diagnosis. And I see parents who really want a diagnosis. You know, there's still in lots of parents' minds, a stigma attached to a formal diagnosis of some sort. Um, here, we see a diagnosis as some sort of superpower because it, it shows you who you really are and the things that you're brilliant at and the things that you struggle with. And I think the older your child gets, and certainly in my case with my child, um, the greatest understand, you know, the bigger the understanding he has of himself, the less he worries about things. He understands why he finds some things difficult, um, because he's got that understanding of himself, and he doesn't use it as an excuse to get out of anything, and he just gets on with it. But with this knowledge that he's got this superpower that makes him unique and makes him special. I think um, you really need to be transparent when you're a Senko. Um, the, you know, the best relationships I have with parents are when I'm completely honest with them about processes and completely transparent because processes, sort of referrals, um, applications for things are frustrating and they're they can take a very long time. Um, and I think you have to be transparent about be transparent about the mistakes you've made. And because there will be, there will be mistakes that you make and you have to have a really good relationship with them. And, and that is a big part of it, being transparent, being honest. Um, I have great relationships with our parents here, you know, not always, not always. And that's difficult. And it is always difficult to not take it personally. Um, but generally, I have great relationships because I'm honest and I give them a lot of time. And I think you need to be available. You need to be available when they're having a bad morning. You need to be available when they just need a chat. You just need to be available to them. And I think that's what makes the best Senkos. So the most successful children that I see here is when we've had a really good relationship with the parents and we've worked together um, through their school life, you know, to come up with outcomes, support plans that are beneficial for them, that really tap into what we need them, you know, to be able to, to do before they leave, leave us. Um, I think being open to this dialogue with parents is just so essential. And I think, you know, not everybody gives parents the time that they deserve because really they, they know the child best and listen to them. And I would say that to all Senkos, all teachers, listen to these parents. They do know these children really well. They know them inside and out.